capability development, which is being done by the public sector and the DPSUs. Well, well, by flagging that, may I straight away just say, invite you, uh, invite uh, uh, Lieutenant General Raj Shukla to please come and share his views on the subject of theatrization, way ahead of achieving convergence. Uh, there are two questions that have been flagged for you, sir. Brief assessment of the existing threat perception and the need for formulating joint doctrines and building joint structures. And the second aspect, futuristic alignment of theatre commands in the Indian scenario. Thank you, Jehan, and over to General Raj Shukla. Uh, Lieutenant General VK Aluwalia, Director Claus, uh, the DG Strategic Planning, General Divan, Session Chair, General Arun Sahani, distinguished colleagues, past and present, uh, officers of the Claus fraternity, fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen. A very good afternoon, a great pleasure to be back at the Claus at this Indian Army's annual seminar, quite appropriately named Divya Drishti the ability to see into the future with perspicacity. And that's what we hope to do today in this third session, while speaking on the very topical issue of multi-domain operations. The Chief of the Army Staff, General Naravne, set the ball rolling earlier this morning by expounding on the key attributes of multi-domain operations, the chronic MDO, and its smart leveraging in the Indian strategic context. The COS, in my view, made three important or three to four important points that I would like to emphasize, reiterate. And firstly, the, um, and this is in response to many of the criticisms that these forums are merely uh, forums or platforms for ideation, but not useful for or for meaningful follow up action. So that may be, uh, I, I quite appreciate that view because uh, once bitten, twice shy, but we have our trying to make these forum as closely related to action on the ground. I'll give you an example. We had this sem seminar on disruptive technologies. We looked at all the technology, technological possibilities, you know, low hang, the ones, uh, uh, shall, shall we say the medium kind of technologies and the absolutely disruptive ones. And what the Indian Army has done thereafter, we made a presentation to the chief, we drew a roadmap, we presented it to the Raksha Mantri, and many of these projects have got rolling. So, for example, we are doing a project on 5G as a proof of concept in the MCT, and we'll take it to one of the formations. We are doing something on rare earths. Uh, we are doing a lot of stuff on high space UAVs. We are also consciously now saying that we'll fund R&D and we'll fund failures because we realize that's the nature of the game. Uh, a lot of low end stuff. By low end, I don't mean that it's less important, but that is easily in reach in 15 core, 16 core of great value. You've heard of a lot of things that Anup Mishra has done, Captain Raj Prashad, Anand Bhatt, Colonel Sai, Secure WhatsApp. So all I'm trying to say is that a lot is happening in this domain of disruptive technologies as an example of why these four are, are so important. And that's precisely what we wish to do with MDO. The concept was spelled out by clause, not by us, but we saw its utility. And as General Huda suggested in the morning, we'll create a cell. Uh, we will uh, uh, play the concept in the headquarters, take it to doctrines and execution. Uh, the chief spelled out the key attributes and the concept in the Indian context, but I shall try and drive home the importance of this concept uh, so that we communicate this concept down to field formations. Because unless field formations adopt them and they accept them, I quite agree this formation, this concept will remain uh, theoretical and at some stage uh, will lose traction. I must also use this forum to assure um, many of you present here and those online that huge changes are underway in the Indian Army in the technology space, R&D, startups, and capacity building. That's one area we, where we were weak. And in all humility, may I tell you that we made great strides. The, who could have thought six years back that this demo that we saw on offensive drones was done between the Indian Army and a Bangalore-based startup? And we did it from two drones we saw to about 75 that you saw. I, I acknowledge that there's a long way to go, 
but all this stuff is happening because we realized that we have to create technologies that are known. We have to understand them, uh, look at their operational tactical utility and draw out a roadmap for us. All others will help, but nobody will create these technologies and donate them to you. So that's that's been our experience and that's what we are trying to do. Uh, in these emerging domains, may I like to say that budgets are not a constraint. I can tell you that the funding for the R&D exceeds that of our capacities to come up with solutions. These are some of the practical issues that has been my experience. And uh, where we really need to intensify efforts is in terms of orientations, attitudes, because MDO is as much about culture as it is about technology. MDO is as much about imagination, and I'm talking of combat imagination and combat innovation. I'll give you a, a, a wish to share this lovely example of Selkuk Bayraktar, who's all well, very well known now because Turkey has become this drone superpower. But how does this concept start? It start, starts out as a dream. Selkuk Bayraktar is a student, Turkish student at the MIT, and sometime in 2004-05, he swarms two drones and comes and shows it to his uncle, who's somebody in the Turkish army, as a dream. And he, the uncle, takes him to a scientist. They grow that concept of drone swarming then in 2004. And as this concept was being developed, there were skeptics all around the world. But in the ultimate analysis, see what Turkey did in the face of technology denial from the USA, they become an established drone superpower. We saw both in Idlib in Armenia, Azerbaijan, how the traditional prima donnas, armor, artillery, and dagger infantry were scampering. So this is how technologies are changing the character of war. And technologies are important, but it is as much about combat imagination, combat innovation, energy, enterprise, and this whole cultural shift, which in conservative organizations like the armed forces, we know is how difficult to inculcate. So that is the, uh, another challenge that we are, we are grappling with. Well, uh, we've had some thoughtful discussions, even after the chief spoke, with many penetrative insights into numerous facets of the operational concept. And since I was plugged in, I heard all of them. So allow me in my allotted time to place the utility, salience of the concept in the context of jointness, theatrization, etc. Because that's, been, uh, that's what I've been asked to do. And I propose to do so by firstly explaining as to why we must embrace MDO if they are to respond effectively to the great strategic flux around us. Uh, the new strains in conflict, all the stuff that you keep hearing about kinetic, non-kinetic, contact, non-contact, and the profound changes in the character of war. Now, for many years, we've been talking of these profound changes, but in the last year we saw it, if that was not profound enough in the character of war, what will be? So these things are happening. I would suggest that there is no option not to embrace MDO. In fact, I think the Americans, despite all their technological prowess, at one stage made a conscious choice not to embrace MDO, and they paid the price. So we should not make a similar mistake, and I'll be glad to respond to questions during the, um, the question-answer session. So let me try and make this persuasive case for MDO wherein the virtual, cyber, and cognitive, the thinking and information-based domains seem to be matching the physical domains in reach and impact. The impact of these domains are as consequential as the physical fights, the company squad and battles, and that, thing, that is something that I urge you to consider. Now, these profound changes in the character of war are driven principally by the disruptive impact of technologies, but also, as I said, by growing imagination and innovation in combat. The latter sometimes being more important. And secondly, I'll try and elaborate as to why jointness, integration are central to our becoming proficient to training mastery in multi-domain operations. Not merely theaterization, but much, much more and at far greater pace and scale. The various metrics of jointness and integration are not merely enabling, they are central to the growth of a multi-domain force. In a sense, MDO is about a renaissance in combat, thought, and action, while jointness, integration will provide the necessary grees and accelerators to ease this transition and impart velocity and scale to MDO. So they are complementary. I'm making the point that if we do not move further in this 
along this road to jointness and at speed and scale, MDO will bypass us. RMO bypassed us, RMA, because we simply refuse to get joint. So if you refuse to get joint, these revolutions will come and go. But the fault lies not with the revolution, but with you. So that's the, uh, that, that's the point I like to make. Now, what is MDO? It is all about the conjoint response of the militaries of, shall we say, Western nations to the crafty moves of our adversaries. Maneuvers by some resurgent expansionist powers on the strategic chessboard in three key interrelated dimensions. And I think the chief alluded to them in the morning. The first point is, and this is something that we have to consider, whether militaries like us need to be as proficient in strategic competition as in hardcore kinetics. And that is where America made their choice. They said, we will concentrate on hardcore kinetics. And they said consciously that the strategic spaces below are not important. And that is where, in my view, they suffered a reverse. So once again, that is the principal point. And the lesson from what the adversaries are doing seems to be that you have to be as proficient in strategic competition as in hardcore kinetics. That's the first point that this conference must address. The second is that these huge capacities that are being created in stand of deterrence, anti excess bubbles, some of them General Sharma referred to, LRVs, hypersonics, and all that. The question before the Indian Armed Forces is you have to find innovative ways to penetrate that excess anti excess bubble and create the same stand of capacities in the IOR from the Malakka down to your shores. These are not, I would say, distant propositions, but they are stark choices staring you in the face. If you don't act now, you will fail if or when, or why if and when, it is already here. The PLA is your maritime neighbor. He has got a very potent eastern maritime flank. The western maritime flank in the form of Gwadar Djibouti is developing. So it's once again not a choice in the future. We have to make the choice now. The other issue is, you know, about space, electromagnetics, this, that, and the other. The mistake that Western militaries made is that while the adversary shifted to these newer domains, we did not develop concurrent proficiencies in those domains. So that's again a choice. Should you develop concurrent proficiencies in those domains? And here the stark choice is once again not either this or that. It has to be the physical fight remains important. The company's quadrant battles and all those remain important. But that does not give you the choice not to gain traction in these other spaces. So that is the, the, the third reality. So let me explain or at least deal, try and deal with each one of these very briefly. The first of the three domains, which is leveraging the competition space, should be or should be not. Now, what happened? Even as in the lexicon of Western democratic nations and the Indian armed forces faces similar dilemmas because we are somewhat similarly schooled and inclined, the, uh, the, uh, the lexicon developed something like this. War became an anomaly and peace became the new armor, normal. So war was the anomaly, peace became the new normal. And their armies focused consciously on war, the high-end kinetics, wherein the thresholds got higher and higher. So to go to war was not a, merely a sovereign decision of a nation, but you went to the United Nations in many cases. In the conventional domain, more so in the nuclear domain. And so in consequence, what happened that the wily adversary made use of this vast new space thus vacated to intensify and prevail in the strategic competition. And therefore, we all heard of these terms, the gray zone and hybrid spaces, which he not only gained uh, ascendancy, he digitized them. He digitized them rapidly. And that was an addition, additional challenge. And even as he did it, he used it successfully to secure national interests and national security objectives. Now, if he had not done it, there would be no cause for worry. But the fact is that he did it, all the while taking care not to cross hold the threshold of provocation. He, 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 he didn't do that. The thresholds for all out conflict and nuclear war, fight, war fighting were in fact so high that they became irrelevant to the new competitive spaces that I referred to. So this is what happened. Now contained by the classical war and peace dispositions, all this business of union war book and mobilization, so on and so forth, uh, 
And because the Western militaries came to this choice of either war on peace and no in between and these high thresholds, the Western militaries locked themselves out of the competition space wherein the adversaries, as I said, gained and exerted great influence. So once he gained ascendancy, he radiated influence in the region, uh, in the immediate neighborhood, region and beyond. So this is what started happening thus prevailing in the strategic competition in this critical first fight. Now, the argument for MDO is that you must first gain proficiencies in this competitive space, win this first fight because it will leave you poised better to penetrate all these anti excess bubbles, so on and so forth, if this escalates to a full-fledged conflict. So that's, that's, that's the logic. Two, in order to preserve this freedom of maneuver in the competitive space, the adversary once again invested greatly in what came to be known as standoff deterrence. Predicted on these strong anti-excess area denial bubbles, long-range vectors, anti-ship cruise missiles, quantum-enabled precision navigation and timing systems, hypersonics and strategic air defense, S-300, S-400 and all of that. So in the Southeast China, see these examples are important. China first delineates this very imperious nine dash line. So it starts off from a strategic concept. Nine dash line beyond the second island chain, thus kind of marking off the outer periphery of the anti-axis bubble, and then proceed systematically to fortify it thereafter with a series of overlapping capabilities across multiple domains, air, artificial islands on land, sea, electronic warfare, cyber and space, a risk of vectored with long range range precision fires in the forms of the DF-26, the DF-21D, the H-6K bomber, the Su-30 fighter, radius, anti-aircraft system, so on and so forth. And having thus secured the strategic military space, it now indulged in unprecedented gamesmanship, risk escalation, and robust competition. Now, this is the point I make. It's not a simple choice that if militaries one day decide to get into this competitive space, you'll win in the first instance. You won't, because all these things that I'm talking of gamesmanship, risk escalation, and robust competition, you will learn them by and by, as we shall see with a few examples. So China took this conscious decisions where their Coast Guard ships were 12,000 ton behemoths, size of modern destroyers, which could sink a 5,000 ton ship to the floor. With what purpose? Ostensibly, it was a vessel for coastal security. In reality, it became a tool of maritime coercion. Now, if such gamesmanship is going to come to the IOR five to 10 years from now, the time to take a decision this way or that is now. So that is, is, is the poser. These examples must also tell you how even mighty armies like the US learned their lessons. So there were numerous incidents that see thereafter to challenge the concept of freedom of navigation, establish strategic ascendancy, and ultimately create these new strategic realities without a shot being fired. So how did all this pan out? In the early years, you have the Chinese aircraft carrier, the Liaoning, on one of its maiden deployments. It challenges a US armada, threatens a sea clash, risk escalation is pitted against restraint, a characteristic of modern armies of the West, also India, we are schooled in restraint. Now, the dilemma before the captain of the American ship is change course or risk, risk collision. What does he do? In the event, the American ship backs off. The Chinese, this proved to be a Chinese way of adding muscle to the argument of 12 nautical miles. So I'm making the point that it was a carefully thought through decision to compete in the city in the space before below all those thresholds. Now look at the dilemmas here. If the target does too little, it faces the prospect of a series of small but cumulatively significant defeats. If it does too much, it risks being held responsible for reckless escalation. If you take your mind, those times, those were the debates. So in the early days, uh, US Navy unskilled in MDO succumbed to bluster. It succumbed to bluster when the Liaoning on its maiden deployment dared to muster up a clash. In July 2017, the USS Theodem, one of the most powerful warships in the world, prowls the South China Sea. And now its mission is, you know, to follow track within 12 nautical miles of the Triton Island, part of the Parasil group. And China has said that it will fire on any vessel that violates the sovereign, sovereign territory. The mission of Stidham is to do exactly that. 
send a message to China that you cannot steal islands, uh, you cannot indulge in this game of diplomatic chicken because it could lead to war. And suddenly the radio on the stadium comes alive with a warning from the Chinese, turn back. The Asia system shows Chinese jets closing in, J-11s at 545 nautical miles. Each jet is assigned SAMs mounted on the stadium. Chinese destroyers are also picked up. The dilemma of the captain of the stadium, much like the dilemma of the American warship against the Liaoning many years ago, is this, if he does not defend the ship, it will be blown out of the water. If he attacks first, it could lead to war. Who will bring first? Who will play the edge better? This time the American ship streams along. So at 35 nautical miles, there is a no response to query from Steedham. 25 nautical miles, warning issued by Steedham. 10 nautical miles, the ship radars light up the incoming jets for engagement. But at five nautical miles, once the jets fly past, the cameras discern that the wings are clean and there are no missiles. So in the event, the jets simply fly over. There is no incident. But the conclusion is that the U.S. Navy, now skilled in MDO, calls the bluff. It succumbs to bluster earlier, now it calls the buff. But having ceded the first mover advantage in the South China Sea, there are grave consequences. I narrated two incidents, but if you aggregate all the incidents, what is the strategic consequence? So in a testimony made to the U.S. Senate in early 2018 by Admiral Philip Davidson, then CNC of IPACOM, PACOM now IPACOM, he says China is now capable of controlling the South China Sea in all scenarios short of war. So you take the nine dash line and all that was done, a careful strategic military enterprise and this whole geostrategic space is now China's. And this is the CNC saying it. And he says, the onus of restoring the status quo ante is now with the USA, but a distinct impossibility given the pre prevalent strategic realities. So the lesson is that proactive action and deterrence in the competition spaces in, in, in winning the first fight may have been wiser. The third point, even as we Western democratic nations fixed our gaze on building core capacities in the traditional domains of land, air, and air, sea, our adversaries took the battle to the newer domains of space, cyber, the electromagnetic spectrum, informatics, social media, so we have the strategic support force coming up and all this. These were well thought through experiments to make sure that you marry land, air, and sea with the space and cyber domains. And that is what the Americans do much later. The UK, UK Strategic Command also sets up a command with a similar purpose. Now, the point is that despite having the technological edge, who lagged in cognitive thought? It was the Western militaries. Why should that have happened? So MDO is not so much about capacity. In our case, it could be about building technological capacity also. But in the Western sense, it was about a deliberate decision, I would say, lack of cognitive thought. So you conceded the space, and now MDO is essentially about reacting to what the adversary has done. In consequence, the US armed forces concluded that the deterrence had got diluted, the Western militaries lost the deterrence edge that they once enjoyed, and therefore they decided to embrace MDO. And here are a few more examples of how multi-domain capacities their creation and their smart leveraging have found increasing utility salience as tools of statecraft in militaries abroad. It will help us to make decisions. So please consider this. In 2008, Russia conducts an incursion into Georgia. It's a huge military failure in terms of inadequate intelligence, sensor shooter malfunctions, uh, badly uh, conducted offensive maneuvers, sustainment operations, and so on. Putin conducts an interagency brief to fix, the, uh, to, uh, to fix the problem. An army general, Russian general, argues for modernization, equipment, priority funding, etc., etc. So he's making a case for restoring of conventional superiorities. As it happens, he's fired on the spot. He's fired on the spot, new generals are brought in, new thought processes kick in. As a result, six years later, a transformed Russian military now imaginative in concepts, innovative in its mechanics, and excess Crimea without firing a shot. Incursion into Donbass region of Ukraine is conducted, where we heard all this of 16 types of unmanned alien vehicles being used, uh, uh, a battalion of MBRLs blowing apart two battalions of mechanized infantry uh, 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 of, the, of the Ukraines in two minutes. Now this cannot have happen with industrial era competencies 
in terms of our 72 hour, 96 hour targeting cycles. And all this needs a conceptual shift in your outlook, thought. So while we are handicapped in terms of funding, or we may not have the luxury of the funding that the Americans have, technology we have to make good. There is nothing stopping us from being more imaginative and innovative. And MDO is essentially about imagination and innovation. So the countries that have done well in this whole game are Turkey, Russia, which were economically perhaps as or lesser prosperous than us economically. So that's so that's the question about you know MDO. And we've also seen some reasonably successful Russian expeditionary operations into Syria in 2018. They seized the Sea of Azov and so on and so forth. Very recently, an example of kinetic strike in the competitive space, the assassination of General Soleimani. So you have payoffs in terms of deterrence. The, the adversary's behavior is significantly modified. The Americans always had the option not to carry out this kinetic spice, but this time they overrode the urge for excessive caution and much of the adversary bluster turned out to be foam. So this is how moves in the uh, the, in the in the competitive spaces could be useful or they could be counterproductive. So what must we do? What must the Indian Army, Indian Armed Forces do to overcome the pitfalls of dilutory deterrence? Well, we must very simply, for obvious reasons, embrace MDO with renewed vigor and purpose. But of course, all the actions that we take must be rooted in the Indian reality. The Indian Armed Forces of the future will need to be as adept in prevailing in the strategic military competition and it's not that we are not doing it. We are doing it. We are doing it along the LAC. We are doing it along the LC. We must take similar propensities down to the IOR, to the aerospace domain. How do we imaginatively penetrate the anti-excess bubble? How do we imaginatively create an anti-excess bubble from Malacca to our shores? And it can be done. So this is where, you know, MDO may come uh, useful. Uh, the days of real militaries doing only full-fledged kinetic conflict are over. So that's the point we have to address. That, of course, remains our primary purpose. We must not dilute that. We must not dilute that. But we must be as proficient in the other forms of gray zone combat and conflict, military gamesmanship, risk escalation and control, so on and so forth. If I may draw a cricketing analogy, not five day cricket alone, but also the other formats of contest and contestation, one day cricket, T20, the day and night stuff and all that. So that is you know, the, the first call that we have to take uh, as far as uh, not only wars of attrition, but also wars of cognition, which means about thinking, about creating, being resilient in these mind games, those learning type encounters, all these proficiencies also take time to develop. So we must develop, regain muscle control and memory in the competitive spaces will be useful in the years to come, not only along the LAC, as I said, certainly in the IOR, We'll see shades of what we see in the South China Sea today. As much in the aer aerospace domain, you will have these things which you've seen in the Baltic about adversary aircraft doing barrel rolls within 25 feet of our own air, 25 feet of our own aircraft, or our ships being overflown, coerced by adversary fighters within 30 feet. So this is the kind of stuff which may happen in the MDO. Now, the second lesson is that the mastery of traditional domains of land, air, and sea no longer suffice. We will need to upgrade our capacities significantly in the new, 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 newer domains. Now, here I would be the first to admit that while there are huge possibilities, there are huge challenges. The space agency and the cyber agency are just the first baby steps. We have to go a long way. For example, in space, we have to compress our revisit times, make sure that our imagery availability spirals reduce drastically, create downloading stations in theaters. We have to make sure that these information flows at 5G speeds, um, and not only imagery, but also the ability to protect our assets in space. At some point in time, the Defense Space Agency will be required to protect the satellites of ISRO. That's what the US is doing. So, But the issue is that if we do not make a start now, when will we? So while I do concede, similarly in cyber, cyber warfare is all about creating offensive capacities, being in enemy networks, he being in your networks in peacetime, you know that each of the, the adversary is there, that creates natural deterrence. But to create these capacities takes a long time. And let me tell you that we have taken steps. Uh, there are other issues of blockchain. You know, when we talk of blockchain and quantum being futuristic technologies, are they actually futuristic? Because what blockchain and quantum will do today 
is that it will help you secure your cyber networks and instantly shift the advantage from offense to defense. So they are here in our technologies with instantaneous tactical operational impact. So I'm, my argument is that this luxury of postponing these decisions does not exist. They stare you in your face and you, 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 you have to take him. And this, you know, similarly, this whole business of the electromagnetic spectrum, algorithm warfare. Now, is it theory? The fact is that the leaders in software designing are Indians. The lowest data development costs are in India. So why should the Americans be lecturing us on Project Maven? Of the Israelis talking to us about algorithm warfare. I mean, these are, you know, some of the things that we, we have to answer. This morning, this chief, you know, outlined a typical MDO engagement. You know, quite possible. Let me just reiterate what were the four, four or five metrics and then I'll try and debate each of them. So this combat group in a typical MDO engagement could be enabled by low orbit technologies, a tri-service combat cloud, a cyber strike, a swarm of offensive drones to take on the counter attacking forces, all predicated on smart convergence and innovating bundling of technologies. All these technologies are available in Bangalore, Hyderabad, Pune, hubs of India. So why should we not make an attempt to harness this? Why should that concept be dubbed theoretical? After all, who transformed the DARPA in the USA? Arti Prabhakar. Who transformed innovation in the USA? Raj Shah. So these are Indians. Indian minds, Indian engineers, software, data development costs. So why should we not do that? But I agree there are huge challenges. I've outlined the ones before the space agency and defense agency, uh, the, sorry, the cyber agency. They will need to be changes in targeting philosophies and capabilities. We are used to targeting formations and echelons. We will now have to switch to targeting of network systems and nodes. And the targeting of network systems and nodes will come from progress in non-kinetic capacities, directed energy, spoofing, cyber capacities could be used to disable space. Now, all these are possibilities which are happening in the civilian space, militaries abroad. If you put all of them together, the typical MDO engagement that we talked of would be a reality. Low orbital technology, so you see everything before you, a cyber strike, could replace a kinetic strike. So you will have ones and zeros and not necessarily TNT to take out the uh, radar systems and so on and so forth. Swarm of drones, drones today actually are being swarmed to about 50, 60 kilometers in depth through cloud uh, computing and all that. They are being used to automatically engage and uh, uh, take on targets. And we did this here. We did this here. Though of course we compress some distances and all because of reasons of safety and for ease of demonstration. But I'm saying that adopt those technologies which are in the realm of possibility. The second point that I like to make about, you know, this theatrization and so on. Theatrization, theater commands are mere structural corrections. If concurrently we do not make this huge transition from industrial era of war fighting to digital era competencies, the theater commands will be meaningless. So that's the point about MDO. But within the theaters, if we can concurrently do transit to digital era competencies and do some of the things that I just said, a theater command within the Northern Theater tomorrow should be able to carry out an MDO engagement. So mere structural corrections will not do. Other cognitive corrections are as important along the road to jointmanship. And one is that we have to make this huge transition to digital era capacities. Let me give you an example of you know, what, what, what we need to do. So military capacities in the future will not be about building the biggest tanks, guns, and aircraft alone. This is not an argument against these big platforms. They will continue to be very important in full-fledged conflict. And as of today, I don't think any military have found solutions to this. It's just, it is not that you can abandon full-fledged conflict and concentrate on this. It is not a matter of either or, but both. It is not that, but investments, proficiencies, and the softer layers of hard power will just be as significant. Smart algorithms. Combat apps, how do we evolve into a space force? The wisdom with which we exploit opportunities in cyberspace. New age skills, I think General Hudda referred to this morning. To do all this, you will need to create a new kind of mindset, HR skills, which thrive in ambiguity and chaos. These kind of traits need to be developed. Our whole PME recruitment, talent, uh, shall I say management and retention models will have to change. We've had this good experience with the CTW, where we've seen engineering graduates 
are now challenging entries of other banks. They are doing well. So the, the age-old system of recruitment, talent management will have to be modified. Much of it, must, may I assure you, is also being done. Today we have officers going to some of the best universities. I'll name these universities. I hadn't heard of them. Heidelberg University, University of Maryland, Cranfield, Stanford. As we speak, officers are going. Now we need better management because once they come from those universities, they disappear into a, a battalion and brigade and never return. So all that we have to do. The study leave system, MTEC systems. The Indian Army has 15,000 BTECs, 90 MTECs every year, increasing to 150. Israel gives 12 MTECs every year, but each of the quality of Danny Gold who produces the Iron Dome. So we are be, being a little more, shall I say, uh, applying strict audit and all this. We are saying, all right, 40, 50 percent can be for other purposes, but 50 percent of the MTECs and BTECs that we give must be strictly aligned to the needs of the armed forces. So, for example, I'll give you the ANC said that this year we are doing 200 kilometers of tunneling and not a single officer doing an MTEC in tunnel engineering. Because we didn't look at these systems that way. They were just seen, you know, people went and did their MTECs. But there is enough scope if we, you know, apply greater, apply our minds in these domains or new age skills, as I said, a new ecosystem with agile bureaucracy is just as critical. All this will not happen, and this is where Western militaries are suffering. There's a person, Zhang Wee Wee, please Google him. He was the advisor to Deng Xiaoping, his English interpreter. He has written a monograph on Western style uh, nations and militaries. It's called The Three Genetic Flaws of Democracies. And the third point in that is their obsession with processes and procedures. And he goes on to say, strangle them in their own systems. And the Chinese are funding courses abroad where we are told to add chapter and verse to a DPP while they deliver technologies in compressed time frames. It is no accident that today if the Americans renovate a bridge in four years, the Chinese renovate the bridge in 49 days. So agile bureaucracies are equally important. Otherwise, technologies will not come. MDO capacities will not come. And this is no longer a matter of turf. It lies at the heart of the MDO challenge. So all this agile bureaucracies have to come. So MDO and DPP mindsets are contrary. This is something that we have to face and overcome because this is the, this is the challenge. If we are to embrace MDO, it's many tenets and nuances in the joint ship, ship space, we'll have to travel fast and furiously. We have to move from jointness to interoperability to tri-service integration. If MDO is to become a reality, as I said, from industrial era proficiencies to digital era competencies. Now, I just like to explain this. This is the biggest challenge in terms of network architecture designs and protocols. So today we have these single service networks if they are to be reconfigured to meet MDO aspirations to talk to each other, as General Sharma was saying, they will be cost prohibitive. But the Americans are doing it, the Chinese are doing it, so why can't we do it? Today you have these combat clouds, uh, which have common standards, a secure architecture, AI-enabled apps, which enables each organic service to tap into with its own systems without changing. So if sub, such things are in the realm of technical possibility, and they seem to be because the Americans are experimenting with it, why should we not? So what was hitherto for an impossibility? Three networks which couldn't talk. Today with technologies, if they can talk, what will happen? You will have this cross-domain aggregation. So a platoon commander in Ladakh will have the option of tapping sure. into either sure. satellites maneuvering overhead okay. or a RPA, ISA enterprise, or even air power. Now, this may happen 10 years from now, but if this happens, can I, platoon commander doing that. Yes, can I request the army commander another two minutes? Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. About protocols. Conceptually, the MD talks of taking any asset, any sensor, and calibrating it with any shooter. So, conceptually, the satellite of the NTRO, the ISRO, the DSA, or even an ally, as we talk of strategic partnerships in the IOR and an ally. If that can be aligned with a shooter, it could be a Rafale, it could be a LRV, it could be a ship-based anti-tank missile, it may happen 15 years from now. But if it has to happen 15 years from now, we have to start thinking now. So this is also about uh, MDO. And, you know, this convergence will have to be in seconds and minutes. It cannot be these 72-hour protocols of JOC and advanced headquarters, JOC, and all that you have. 
So MDO is about creative solutions. And this is where when we talk of digital era combat, it is these elongated targeting cycles, procedures, protocols, which, which, which could be compressed. Inter-agency cross-pollination is as critical. If an NTRO satellite is to calibrate with an LRV, we cannot have these silos. In fact, towards complete civil military fusion is the way forward. And today it is happening. When in the technology space, at least, the way the startups have come in, private sector has come in, and they're collaborating with us to make our tactical dreams and operational dreams a reality. It is happening, and we will have to take it forward in the days and uh, times to come. As I said, MDO is also about the strategic partnerships. So we have to make these conscious choices about burden sharing, about division of labor in the IOR. We also need to make these conscious choices of adding military heft to our strategic partnerships. We have to weigh it against strategic balance balancing and the age-old dilemma of strategic autonomy. So if MDA, in conclusion, you know, in thought as an action and action, successful MDO will lie at the intersect of five, of five metrics. Technological impetus, fusing of domains and strengths, organizational adaptation. If organizations don't adapt, as I said, the RMA bypassed you, it will bypass MD, will again. Technologies must play up. Uh, very rightly, somebody observed NCW um, uh, failed because the accompanying technologies did not become a reality. So the, 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 the concept full spectrum dominance played, failed for a, a similar reason. But at the end of the day, the answer cannot be the, the hope that the concept fails. We have to work to the reality if the concept succeeds with the info adversary, especially so because you have a neighbor who is a superpower and who's working actively in this domain. So may I conclude by saying that in my view, my very humble view, in our case, NDO is not an option. It is a reality that we must embrace with diligence and with speed. Thank you and Jahan. Thank you very much, Dwayne uh, Shukla. I think it, it allowed you to continue giving us this great exposure of the activities that the armed forces are doing. And thank you very much. But I think if I had to just highlight three key issues that he did say, he gave us positive steps that the army is taking for the emerging technologies. Uh, he made a fantastic argument to say why we are at that threshold where it is irrevocable for us to adopt the MDO. I think. We also have to look at two issues which he said that the MDO jointness and integration uh, are actually complementary. And I think the importance of looking at the strategic space, if we do not utilize and get